David, where are you? Welcome. Good to have you back. Let's pray for you. you. Father God, thank you for David. Thank you for bringing him back to us. And Lord, to share your word that he has for us. Lord, help us to listen to what you've got to say. Change us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Good morning, lovely people of Brigade. Good to be back with you and to look at God's Word together. I imagine most of us have watched dramas on television, and some of them are particularly centered around a person. And in fact, without that person, they kind of lose their thread. So you get titles of dramas like the famous Oxford ones with uh, Morse and Lewis, and then you get the Poldark, and you get Vera, you get Doc Martin, (laughs) George Gently, May Gray, Inspector Meltabano, if you ever come across him, and the, the stories which repeat, they come, they're different stories each time, perhaps over a session of eight or ten weeks. Uh, but they're all centered around that character. And they can be good drama, but they are fiction. When we come to the Gospels, the Gospels are very dramatic descriptions. And if they were ever put into a TV presentation, the best title for them would be Jesus or Christ Jesus, because he is the central character. He is the one that makes it all fit together. And the writers of the Gospels would gradually unfold this story, this amazing, extraordinary story about this amazing, extraordinary person, Jesus Christ. And right at the beginning of most of the Gospels, there's an explanation of the main character, of Jesus himself. Who is he? Some inclination of who he is, what his mission's going to be, why he's come to earth. Hear what uh, the angel Gabriel said to Mary as recorded in Luke 1. She said, he said, you're going to be with child. And and she was concerned, not surprisingly, about that. You will be with child and give birth to a son and you're to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and we called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be? Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin. And the angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Matthew will add in too that his name is Emmanuel and that he will be called Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. So right at the start, just as this child comes onto the scene, there's kind of three titles there. He's the Son of God. He's God incarnate, taking on flesh, as John says. He was and is the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and then he became flesh. He's the Son of God. He's also the son of David because he comes to establish the kingdom promised to his forefather David many years before. A kingdom that would never end. A kingdom that would show God's rule upon the face of the earth and be righteous and just. Full of mercy and full of grace, full of power, full of holiness. He was the son of David, but he was also the son of man because he will save his people from their sins. And if he hadn't come and taken on flesh and taken on, as we've sung, our sins and our sorrows, then we would have no hope whatsoever of having 
union with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, of coming into the kingdom of our dear Lord and Christ, and doing so cleansed of our guilt and our sin and our shame. So right at the start, there's an indication, there's an introduction. The, the character of these Gospels, the key, in a sense, almost the only principal person of those Gospels, Christ Jesus, is God come among us, bringing the kingdom of God in and saving his people from their sins so that together there can be an enjoyment of God's presence in the heavens and on the earth. Extraordinary drama. And he grows up, and about the age of 30, he actually begins his mission and his preparation for what God the Father has given him to do. And we're just going to pitch in into Matthew 16, and then we'll have a look at that a bit further, because uh, we're in a series called The Candid Jesus. When we get to chapter 16 and towards the end of the chapter, this very strong statement from Jesus Christ. And he says this to those close disciples to him. Then Jesus, verse 24, 16, then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me will find it. What good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world yet forfeits his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels and then he will reward each person according to what he has done. I tell you the truth. Some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. We might ask, why is Jesus saying this at this time? Well, coming back to our dramas, after the first episode, every following episode will have a previously. <laughs> and a few flashes from the previous episode, reminding you of the character, reminding you of the plots and the subplots perhaps jogging the memory, and, and things you didn't quite understand at one point. Oh, yes, of course, I see how they fit together now. Have you ever got those dramas where you haven't a clue what's going on? Because there's so many plots and subplots going on. And so you have the previously. So in this drama, which of course is true, this is not fiction, what is the previously leading up to this point? Well, we see Jesus doing extraordinary things, healings. Healings physically, healings emotionally, healings mentally, even raising the dead, delivering people who are subject to the enemy's pressure onto their lives, the, the torment of spirits, and he delivers them. He makes provision of wine, water into wine, of fish, of bread. He has power over the elements. What man is this that even the winds and the waves obey him? See, he cursed that fig tree and it withered. He's told us to go down the beach and the first fish we have will have a coin in, which, in its mouth so we can pay the tax. He walks on water. What man is this that he has power over the elements. All these, and sometimes it's called that, uh, are signs. And a sign points to something. And it points to a future age when there's no sickness. When there's no death. When there's no mental anguish. When there's no Satan. <laughs> where provision is full and abundant for everyone. No one's starving. No one's going without. Creation is restored. The lion and the lamb will lie together. That which is, as we saw in that picture, all that terrible plastic waste won't be there. Creation won't be spoiled. 
That's what he was doing in the earlier chapters of, of Matthew, as we read. His religion, if you could call it that, was a grace-filled religion, very dissimilar to that which the people had become used to. They'd become used to the uh, teaching of the Pharisees and, and the uh, teachers of the law, the religious law. His teaching, Jesus' teaching, was so remarkable, so authoritative, so fresh, so spirit-inspired, that people said, we've never heard a man speak with this kind of authority before, despite all the rabbis they'd heard. What is it that's in this man that he teaches in such an extraordinary way? And his teaching had within it, and increasingly had within it, the words of the kingdom and the demonstration of the kingdom. This was his emphasis. He began to say, the kingdom you've been looking for is coming in a different way than you anticipated. It's small, probably unnoticed in many ways. The kingdom of God is like this, thrown in the ground, and no one really notices it, but it grows. The kingdom of God, in a sense, grows naturally when the seed is the kingdom of God seed. And the people of the kingdom are the salt of the earth, and the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. And they're the light of the world, and the world is the Lord's and everyone who lives in it. This kingdom is going to affect the whole planet, the whole universe. Inner attitudes, he teaches, are as important and sometimes more important than outward action. He established friendship, close friendship. He said, this isn't a formal religion that I've come to bring you. I'm come to bring you what the Father is like. And we long to dwell with you and to know you and you to know us. And to his apostles and to the women who were with him, a friendship developed, a friendship with purpose because he was talking about the kingdom coming. And what could be done to bring justice and righteousness where there was injustice and oppression? So there's a challenge with it. And then there's an extraordinary kind of change of gear in the earlier part of Matthew 16 when to his close disciples he asks a question. They're in the region of Caesarea Philippi. And he says to his disciples... Who do people say the Son of Man is? And they replied, oh, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you? He asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. You see, when we have a revelation of Jesus Christ, it changes us and it changes our whole perspective on life. And we find ourselves living for his purpose, not our purpose although that makes our purpose the best it can possibly be as we follow his purpose. What is Jesus' purpose, his mission? Well, in, in verse 17, he follows it on and he says, I tell you, you are Peter. On this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. This is changing gear rapidly, accelerating. This is different. They were watching on before on what Jesus did and sometimes helping out and sometimes being amazed at what they were involved in. Suddenly, it's as if Jesus changes gear. He said, okay, I want to focus this thing down. We got to this point. In, in, in our working together. Who do you say I am? And by the revelation that came from heaven, they could say, and we can say, and only by the revelation that comes from heaven, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Do you know that makes no sense whatsoever to us 
unless it is a revelation. We cannot say it by trying hard and thinking about it. It's got to come from above. You've got to be born from above. That's what born again means. You've got to be a, made a person from God, not out of your own efforts and energies. And boy, when that happens, when you have a revelation of Jesus Christ, all things get changed. For good, but also for challenge. Because suddenly you're in a different life. The life you'd planned before doesn't fit now. The life you have now is the life that Jesus has for you. And the plans you had before might be there, but they may well be adjusted because you're now under his plans. We didn't think when we were courting Margaret and I and then got married and kids started to come that we would be planting churches in Cambridge and Oxford. No way. We haven't got degrees. How do we get to the most prestigious universities in this nation and possibly in the world? God says, I've got some plans for you, David and Margaret. You'd never think of them in a month of Sundays. But I've got them for you. Terrifying and yet wonderful. That's what God does when we have a revelation of Jesus Christ. And he says, I'm going to build my church. And I'm going to build it on this rock. And there's, there's many kind of questions from commentators. What does he mean, this rock? Does he mean Peter? Because Peter means rock. Does he mean the confession, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God? Does it mean himself? Well, all those in one sense. But there is another comment that's come that is fairly interesting, actually. Um, that I put before you, and I've heard it from, it's not mine, it's from elsewhere, and, and properly studied. Caesar of Philippi had a, a rock escarpment in its area, in which were many niches where people put idols and worshipped them. Near to it was a stream coming out of the ground, and the suspicion was, and superstition was, this is where the evil spirits came out the gates of hell, the gates of Hades. And Jesus said, I'll tell you where I'm going to build my church. I'm not going to take it off into some corner where it's quiet and nobody's interrupting it and getting in the way, where it's all nasty and, and sinful. No, I, I'm, going to, I'm going to take you over there and you're all going to be okay. He says, no, I'm going to build my church right in the face of all the wickedness and sinfulness. You're going to be in the world but not of the world. You're going to be in the world to change the world by my grace and my power. And where hell spews out its venom, Jesus plants his foot and crushes the evil one. That was promised right away in the early scriptures of Genesis. And the church, which is his body, is part of that crushing. That's not to raise us up into any funny kind of position. It is just to say, this is how Jesus is going to do it. Right in the middle of all the mess and the rubbish and the hatred and the discord and the criminality and the abuse and the perversion, right in the middle of that, I'll plant my church. Can you imagine how they felt? <laughs> Well, things have suddenly changed. We were enjoying it before. Now we're not quite sure. This is a bit bigger than we thought. And that, of course, is why Jesus faced opposition. And why the church will face opposition as the enemy stirs up the world, and indeed in some places religion, against Jesus and against his church. Because Jesus disturbs the status quo of sinful mankind, and so does the church. We don't go out of our way to do that. We're not offensive. We may be an offense, but we don't go out to be offensive. But by the very nature of who we are, I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to find there is opposition because we are disturbing the status quo which is under the government of the prince of this air of the world. 
And Jesus says this, if they hated me, they'll hate you also. Because we threaten vested interests. He threatened vested interests. So that we read later in Acts when um, Peter is standing up and giving his sermon, he says, men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. Fantastic. People surely must respond to that with great rejoicing and to his teaching, etc. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, the Romans, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead. The opposition comes when the kingdom of God comes. We don't have to look for it. It will be there, and we need to know how to cope with it when it comes. And in the middle of all that, Jesus says, actually, you've got the keys of the kingdom. I'm going to give them to you. Church, I'm going to build my church, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom. And you can unlock things, and you can lock things. So when you do get to prayer, if it's not tonight, whenever it is, or at any time, Wednesday morning, early prayer meeting, etc., understand that by prayer, with humility, we can lock things and we can unlock things because Jesus has given us the keys. So he says to them, it's time to take stock of where we're at because the next part of what Jesus is going to do will require them to make a decision. Having found that they've understood he's the Christ, the Son of the living God, they're going to have to make another decision. Will they follow him regardless? And he says this, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests and teachers of the law. He must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside, began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Phew. This is a bit frightening, isn't it? But you can sympathize with Peter. They've just had this extraordinary statement from the, the son of the living God who says, I'm going to build my church. It's going to be so strong, so powerful, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. You'll have keys to unlock things and to lock things. You'll bring in the kingdom of God, justice, righteousness, etc., healings, miracles. They said, well, we're off, we're ready to go. And he says, I'm going to be killed. That's the way it's going to happen. That's the, way, that's the only way it's going to be able to be working. And Peter perhaps understandably says, no, it can't be that way. It doesn't fit to what you've just said. And Jesus said, that's because you're thinking like men think. You need to become God thinkers, not men thinkers. He said, if you try and do and get involved with what I've been talking about, thinking only men's thoughts, you will never do it. You will be crushed. You have got to be led by the Spirit. It's not by the might of man. It's not by the power of man. It's by my Spirit, says the Lord Almighty. It's the Spirit who gives us God thinking. And it's the Bible who gives us biblical thinking which is the Spirit giving us God thinking. So we need to know what God has done and what his plans are. Because Jesus is saying, actually, I, in so many words, I am being candid with you. I am the king, but I'm the suffering servant king. And that's how the kingdom will come in. If you won't be ready to accept that and to follow through what that might mean with you, and in a sense, you cannot fully be my disciples. And he says to Peter, poor Peter, uh, Peter gets a bit of a raw deal sometimes with what's in the scriptures, doesn't he? Every, every time he puts his foot in it, it's in the scripture. <laughs> and uh, he says to Peter, look, look, you are actually a stumbling block to me by thinking like men think. 
I find that quite frightening in a way, or certainly very challenging. I wonder, I wonder God think, I know I've been around a while, and by God's grace, he saved me a while. And I, I praise him for that. But I still want to God think. And I find there's a pressure, as no doubt you do, uh, from the world coming in to say, no, think our way. This very strange thing. Why doesn't the church get up to date? Well, you can't get more up to date than eternal. <laughs> so you go back to the eternal God and you say, what's up to date, Lord? He says, the same as always. So we're saying, Holy Spirit, please help us. We want to God think. But it's not a, it's, this is not a harsh statement from Jesus. It, it's a strong statement, but it's not a harsh statement. He loved these men. He wanted them to be with him. He chose them to be with them. He wanted them to experience what he did. And he wanted them to take it on in the same spirit and in the same power. He's just saying, look, guys, this is how it is. I'm being, I'm being straight with you. I'm being candid with you. This is what it will be like. But he's full of grace and truth. And so when we follow him, we find it's not harsh. He's full of grace and truth. But it will draw the same kind of opposition as Jesus drew. And this was indicated years and years before in the... And so I'm asking you to, to recognize that and to say, okay, I'll do that. I'll take the mockery. I'll take the ignoring of you when you're in a conversation. You say, what do you do and so on? And what were you doing on Sunday? Well, I was at church. Oh, okay. And as they turn away and talk to somebody else. Or even some, some kind of venom that comes through because we think a certain way and it seems totally different to the world and it is totally different to the world. And you start to share it in conversation and you can feel the hatred of Jesus come up and it, sadly it bounces back onto us. We'll be seen in one sense as rebels. Oh, let's cast off their chains. These do-gooders, these Christians, they, they seem to be so against what we think and what we follow. No, we're for what is beneficial for mankind. And what is glorifying to God. And so in a sense I think Jesus waited until the disciples had an understanding, at least in a good measure, of who he was. That convinced them that he was the Lord, such that they would pour out their life for him and his purpose, his father's purpose. So Paul will put it like this a bit later on in Romans 12. He say, I urge you therefore, brethren, in view of God's mercies that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable act of worship. Don't be conformed to the shifting pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may find out and prove what is the perfect, good, and acceptable will of God. So what they would do and what would happen as they denied themselves or we deny ourselves, we do it out of a personal decision that comes from devotion to Christ, not duty to some religious ritual. You won't do it otherwise. The world, of course, sees the cross as loss. Jesus sees it as gain. We gain, not lose, our soul. What does that mean? Well, who we are, our life, what we're, who we're supposed to be, what God intended we should be, what man was fully intended to be and to do on earth in relationship with God. That's what it is to, to find our soul, to find and be who we are. How many of us are saying, I wish I knew who I really was, my identity, it's, it's in here, it's in Christ. We're new creatures in him. We have a purpose. There's a kingdom coming. It's come, it's coming, and it will continue to come. And against all the backdrop of what seems hopeless and hideous, 
there is, merging, there is emerging a great company of people who love Jesus Christ across the face of the world. And God will be glorified. And Jesus says, do you want to come in on that? It will cost you. But boy, the reward will far outweigh the cost. Furthermore, there will be possibilities and probabilities that many of you will actually see the kingdom in operation. I've seen the kingdom in operation. You have. You've seen people healed. You've seen people delivered out of, out of problems. You, you've heard testimony after testimony here at baptism of extraordinary life-changing happenings because Christ has come into a person's life. We're seeing the kingdom. We're seeing society changed here and there as men and women of God quietly but definitely bring the kingdom in. Some more kind of responsible and authoritative than others by positions that God has given them, perhaps in government, perhaps in, in national health, perhaps in teaching. Some of you are teachers. What you do in your school is bringing in the kingdom of God. And it's interesting in the next chapter that three of the disciples are taken with Jesus to a place where he's transfigured before them. They're amazed. This is the Christ, most definitely. Full of glory. Further revelation of Jesus. Do you want to know more about Jesus? Follow him. Don't worry about your life. Sufficient unto the day is the evil ill. God will provide everything we need according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. We'll learn more and more of what Jesus is like and that will do us a power of good. And it will do society a power of good. And properly understood, the statement and comment of candid Jesus about deny yourself and take up your cross meant that Peter and John could embrace opposition in Acts when they came under persecution. They went from the Sanhedrin rejoicing that they could take on board some opposition in the name of Christ. They weren't fools. They went out again and preached God again, preached Christ again. Nobody could stop them. Something had happened to them. So it comes around to this, finally, really. Same question comes to us, to me. Who do you say Jesus is? Is he the Christ, the anointed one? Is he, or is he Jesus just a, a great help for you and me? There to look after us, which he does. Or is he the Christ, the son of the living God, the most powerful person that's ever stepped on this earth? The man who is now in majesty with rule over principalities and powers in the glory of God. If that's who you reckon he is, then come follow him with me. Let's encourage and support one another in that following him with our eyes on him, despising any shame and reigning with him. How about we be in God's great drama of the ages, together with Jesus? Jesus and supporting cast. You, 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 me, Mike, Nigel. Yep. <laughs> Denise, Jessica, supporting cast, you and me right up there in the front with them, seeing the kingdom come in. What better thing could we give our life to than that? Amen? We're going to go into communion in a minute. Mike will take that, uh, which is a very fitting thing to do, really, to know that as we remember the death and resurrection of our Jesus Christ, we are his body. We are one loaf together. And we are called to be in the kingdom of God with power, with humility, and with great pleasure. Okay, Mike.
band wants to come back. Why the band come back and, and uh, we'll just reflect for a few minutes on what David said. Uh, I'd like eight people to come forward and, and serve communion for us. I haven't picked anyone because I've been on holiday and uh, I haven't officially ended it, so I couldn't be bothered. So uh, <laughs> eight people when you're ready as we, we start to, to pray. But I'd like us to ref- uh, pray, worship. I'd like us to ref- reflect, just stay in your seats as we are, about what that really means, what David has just said about the cost and you know the next two weeks in this series are the final two weeks and the first the first week we're going to be looking at Pentecost and looking around at the power of God's people and I say that there's more to come and on the final week we're going to be looking at sexuality and what the Bible has to say regardless of what the world says and David's just said that culture wants to be pushed upon us and uh, you almost can't be Christian Uh, if you have a biblical view of sexuality. Before you come to this table today, ask yourselves a question. Have I really received Jesus? Am I really willing to do what he says and what his word says, regardless of what culture tells me I should believe and behave? Am I truly willing to do that? Because I have a guess in this church that there are many that aren't. There are many that aren't. And... We've heard it already in this series that Jesus said, I've come to bring a sword. Which side of the sword will you fall on? The biblical side? Or will you fall on the side that is going to get you persecuted? Have a think about that as we just go into worship.